again. Jesus died and rose from the grave. The stone the builders rejected is the one with the power to save. His spirit came with the purpose, living in and through us today. So let faith rise up within us. Let his people join in and say, church family. We are so grateful to be together this Sunday morning, whether you are here with us in person, whether you're joining us online. We've got people in Georgia, Germany, Colorado, Texas, Massachusetts. Happy Sunday. Today we are in week two of Weeds in My Garden, a series where we are unpacking the hope and help that is available um, as we face mental health challenges throughout life. Pastor Barry is going to be breaking down worry and anxiety today. Um, and including some really powerful testimonies from our own church family members. 
Um, if you are first time guests, welcome. We are so glad that you're here and joining us this morning. A great first step for you would be the connect card that's in the seat back pocket in front of you or online at university.church slash connect. Fill that out, drop it in the black boxes or at the welcome desk, and we would love to connect with you later this week and get you plugged in to our church. Um, but for right now, we're going to stand and continue to worship in song. Though Christ was dead, now surely he's risen. Yeah, he's coming back again, and Christ will reign in triumph forever. Yeah, all praise belongs. 
So how are those uh, New Year's resolutions going? Gym membership and the exercise bike? In our house, maybe a f slight less French fries and a few fewer, fewer cookies. 
How about your relationships with your, your spouse, your, your brothers and sisters, your mom and dad, your friends? How about your relationship with God? Pouring time into that? So the encouragement, spending time in, in the Bible and in prayer is pouring into your relationship with God. He has invested everything in you. Total commitment. He offered his son, Jesus Christ, as a savior for our sins so that we could spend eternity, eternity with him. Not 10 years, not 100 years, not 1,000 years, eternity. As we head into this time of communion where we stop and we give thanks and we remember the incredible gift that Jesus Christ gave to us. For those that are here, would you go ahead and uh, please take the elements and pass them. For those at home, um, please grab some bread and some juice and we'll take these together as I read um, from 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please just take some time in quiet and in prayer. Thank God for the incredible gift that he gave us in Jesus Christ. Hey UCC, I'm JC and this is Carla and we serve with Team Expansion in Louisville, Kentucky. And we love getting to do what we do. We get to train and equip missionaries in communications and we get to tell their stories to the church. The reason we do this is because there are still billions of people who have never heard the gospel. And by getting the church more engaged in the Great Commission, uh, we get more people helping to share Jesus with people for the first time. This last year, we have really struggled with this mantra, we can do hard things. Um, the reason that that has come up is because God has invited us and our teammates into a new season of um, asking, like, can we do more for the kingdom? Can we tell messier stories? Can we live a harder life for the sake of the gospel? And the answer is yes. And because of all of that, we are excited to tell you that we are moving to Granada, Spain this August. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a crazy year. We've been spending so much time in prayer, uh, counsel, deliberation, trying to figure out what God was calling us to, where he was calling us to. Uh, we knew he wanted us to be somewhere central because we wanted to work shoulder to shoulder with missionaries and be able to visit them more often. Uh, so we're excited to be centrally located and, and able to start uh, more frequently going on trips uh, to hear stories and share them with you. Uh, but also Spain itself is a great location. We're excited to host workers in the city we'll live in, Granada, beautiful place. And also we have a team there uh, that we're going to work alongside of in local ministry. Spain is only 1.6% evangelical. There's 15 unreached people groups. 
So there's a lot of need uh, for the gospel right where we'll be living. Um, because we are wrestling with these hard things and because we desperately need people to pray with us, we have created a prayer guide, a seven-day guide called We Can Do Hard Things. Each day there's scripture and reflection and prayer points, um, both for you and for our family and ministry. Uh, we would love for you to pray with us. You can pick those up at UCC or you can download a digital copy at tellthirstory.site slash hard things. I don't know if you all know this, but Carla's an awesome writer. <laughs> no, it's a great guide and we really do need your prayers because August is coming fast. There's so much that we have to do and it's very overwhelming and alone we really cannot do hard things. Uh, but with God we can and with your support we can. So we really appreciate you. Thank you all. Bye guys. We are grateful to partner with JC and Carla, members of our own church family who are very much challenging this vicious cycle of getting comfort and then that makes you want more comfort and more. And instead they're saying, no, we can do hard things and it's all for God's good and God's glory and through him. And so we are so grateful to get to support them, um, both with our prayers and also financially. Um, we partner with 30 people in different organizations locally and globally um, so that good news can go out. And we get to do that because as a church, we faithfully and generously give. If you came prepared to give today, or maybe you were inspired by JC and Carla's story, um, you can check out the texting number on the screen, university.church slash give in the Hub app or in the black boxes as you exit the auditorium and balcony. As you do that, let's check out church news. If you're planning a wedding, just got engaged, or have been married less than a year, we've got one coming up at the end of February, and it's designed just for you. One is a one-day intensive on marriage that includes large group teaching time from a group of professionals, as well as small group time with peers and mentor couples. We know the value of seeking this wisdom out in marriage. In fact, our pastors require couples to either go through one or professional counseling before officiating their weddings. This opportunity to build a biblical foundation and practical tools for marriage takes place on Saturday, February 24th. Register in the events tab in the UCC Hub app or at university.church slash calendar. If you've been wondering what it would look like to become a member of University Christian Church, attend Belong, happening at 12.15 p.m. next Sunday. At Belong, you'll hear from our lead pastor and other members of our team about what it looks like to be involved in and committed to our church family. You can RSVP for Belong in the events tab of the UCC Hub app or at university.church slash calendar. Please let us know if you're attending so we can plan accordingly for food and mark if you need childcare. See you right after the 11 a.m. service next week. We've expanded our resource site, university.church slash weeds in my garden. It includes student and military specific resources, as well as 10 part video series on some mental health 101 and a previous sermon series that you might find helpful. Check it out or grab a it's okay to not be okay card from the welcome desk. We started this past week a new series called Weeds in My Garden, and it's actually a series on mental health. And I know for some of you, you go, wait a second, at church, why? How does that fit? Well, you know, the Bible does not ever back away from tough subjects. Sometimes we as the church have historically around the world throughout history, but the Bible doesn't. In fact, there's a tremendous amount of wealth of knowledge and that God admits this life can be hard. He says that it's going to be tough. You will face problems. He talks about stress, anxiety. There's just about everything you can imagine in here. And I don't believe you're here by accident. If you're here today, I, I, my prayer, our prayer as a church is that Along the way, you might encounter Jesus in a deeper sense, maybe for the first time, and for some, maybe that you would just grow in an understanding of something that you accepted but didn't quite 
fully growing yet. See, the Bible deals with a lot of really tough issues, and we're not going to back off of those. We're going to talk about worry. We're going to talk about anxiety, loneliness, panic, ain't self-harm, about suicide, depression, stress, and burnout. Ain't, those are heavy subjects that need to be addressed because there's people all around the world, all around our country, all around this community, and all throughout this church right here who deal with those kind of things. And please hear that God cares about our whole self. There's almost this little lie that self-perpetuates within the church that, well, God, you know, he, he's prepared a place for me. And so basically it's like hands off and he doesn't care about this life. He just cares about then. And that's not true. God cares about now and he cares more about eternity than he does just right in this one moment. The pain that might cause me to go in a bad direction or a good direction I, I want to respond to it where I submit whatever this mess is to him, but he walks with me and he cares and he's a God of compassion as well. And we want to unpack some of that with you. So I hope that it, you'll come along this journey with us. I, I, I hope that you'll ask somebody else to maybe come in and hear, because you're going to hear from counselors and stories and you're going to hear biblical advice as well. But this is going to be one that we do together because God created us to do life together. You know, if you missed this past week, I hope that you'll go back and listen um, because I explained several things in there. We addressed things in that opening week that kind of helped build on where we're going to go. So there's a resource page that I'm going to hit on throughout the series. We're going to talk about it. We've shared it, and we're going to share it again. It'll be in announcements again, and that's because there are resources we don't want you to miss there. Hey, we have a counseling a referral network there listed. We have special ministry helps for those uh, as students and, and also those who are military. We have past sermon series and all kinds of other helps for you. In fact, we have weekly little video messages recorded by a professional counselor here in the community and our church family that just kind of touch on each issue as well. Well, there was a, uh, where we grabbed this title from was a, it was from a viral video that went out by Kendall Inskeep. And she shared this as I, I played it for you last week. She sings, I tell you that I am whole, but I'm actually still healing. I tell you that I'm happy, but I'm grieving. Thought I was a fighter, but I'm still in the fire. If I'm being honest, I'm not being honest. Oh, I give you roses, just hoping that you won't see the weeds in my garden. If I'm being honest, I'm at my darkest. I'm sitting here waiting and praying for someone, someone to show me what love is. I'm just being honest. Those words resonate with all of us because we all relate in some capacity. Maybe you grew up in church kind of like I did where when you walked in, it just seemed like... Everybody had their stuff together. And you knew your stuff, mm, not so together. And they're smiling like, I've never been better. Oh, hey, bless you, man. God's blessing my socks off. And you're like, life kind of sucks and I'm struggling. And I don't know how these guys fit and I don't fit. And so what do I do with this? And I want you to know it's okay to not be okay. That's the essence of the gospel. We really talked about it last week. You can't deal with your stuff if you don't admit it, if you don't say, God, I need help. If, if, if church was for perfect people, churches would be empty across the nation, and there wouldn't be the God. Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross if we were all ones who had our stuff together. Now, I'm so thankful he doesn't leave us where he finds us. And we're going to talk about that as well, but come with your mess and all. And for those who grew up in the church, please, please be cautious. There are numerous roots to uh, anxieties and problems and depression. It can come from situations that we're in in our life. It can be biological. It can be from the clinical side, and it can be spiritual. And yes, pretty much everything in life has a spiritual component, but don't over-spiritualize things, please. When someone's hurting, and you, man, I'm really hurting. I'm going to, well, you just need to pray harder and you, your depression will go away. Those are just stupid things that Christians say. Don't do that. 
And do they need to pray? Yes. I'm not saying don't pray. I'm just saying don't simplify it down to such a base level because it may mean their life is in a situation that they have to change for safety or whatever. It might mean that they need to talk to a counselor. They might need to talk to their doctor. There might be some retraining of their thought process as well. There's lots that go into this beyond just the simplistic. And, and learning to just submit your life to God is not so easy as we sometimes make it. So I want to give you some hope and some help throughout this series Today, we're going to talk about worry and anxiety, and we have to talk on this one. It's the number one mental health issue for women. It's the number two for guys, and it is just getting worse, and it's growing exponentially. So worry can be good. Let me just say that. You're going, what? Wait a second. No. No, God gave us a, a fear reaction, a worry reaction for a reason, because if I go, oh, I could die if I do that. There's a good thing there that you ought to back off of whatever that is. You know, worrying, oh, when I drive, if I'm not cautious, I could be in an accident. You know, oh, there's, there are things that are fear reactions that are healthy when they're kept in check. Worry that is unchecked is debilitating, though. Anxiety that is unchecked. It just totally can compromise your life. And so I want to give some biblical advice, but it's so important to know that we're not alone in our struggles as well. So we're going to share two stories today. The first one I want to share right now, it's Dalton's testimony. Shortly after Rachel and I got married, we, um, we were going through one of our first conversations as a newly married couple, um, going through a budget discussion. Yeah. That was one of the first times I had, I feel like, a true panic attack. Rachel was still going through school at K-State. I had graduated, so I was working full-time. She was working when she could. The responsibility uh, of bringing in money, uh, the financial responsibility really fell on my shoulders, and that was when it really hit me. Um, I was like, whoa, how, how am I gonna be able to provide? Where is this money gonna come from? How are we gonna be able to do this month over month? This doesn't feel sustainable, and just broke down in the kitchen there. Um, it just kind of hit me like a wave all at once. And um, I've never really been able to, to shake that. Um, we've been married for just over eight years now. And I still feel some of that as well. Rachel's a stay-at-home mom. Um, we've got two small children, which I'm extremely thankful for that we're able to do that. And we're blessed to be able to have her stay home. But um, there's still that struggle of being able to provide uh, and, and having that challenge of being the sole provider for the family. Some months are, are tighter than others, and, and I'm in sales, so we kind of ride that roller coaster. It's been really, really easy for me over the years to put, uh, put my faith and my trust and comfort in money, um, put my faith and comfort in our bank account rather than God. That's extremely heavy to try to just carry that burden alone, and I didn't have to do that. But by putting my faith and my comfort in our bank account and in my income, that's where I put my pride and, and my self-worth as well. And um, through the years, and especially up till most recently, that's just been extremely draining. And, and that really led me into a really, really heavy season um, over the last year or so um, to where I finally just felt like I came to the end of myself. And there's that worship song, I'll make room for you to do whatever you want to. And I heard those words and I was like, I'm so tired at this point, I, I don't even want to continue to do it myself. God, if you say your way is better, then by all means, take this from me and, and I wanna do it your way. I wanna put, put it on you. I wanna give it to you. That's been life-changing, but it hasn't been instantaneous. Um, one of the biggest things that's helped me recently as well is, is the book Resilient um, by John Eldridge. Um, he talks a lot about identifying the areas in your life or in your heart that are still separated from God. Um, and being able to, to stop, identify that in the moment, and give that to God. So through a lot of prayer and a lot of petition, um, I, I find myself throughout the day pausing. When I have those anxious thoughts, when I have those anxious moments, or I start to feel hot, start to feel a little overwhelmed, stopping in that, praying over that, giving that to God, and then, and then working to consciously um, move forward. There's a couple of, of quotes um, from that book, Resilient, um, and then, of course, some scripture that I fall back on a lot. God made us and invented us as man invented an engine. The engine was made to run on gas and nothing else. 
Just the same God made the human machine to run on himself alone. He himself is the fuel our spirit was designed to burn. And that was so encouraging um, and almost a relief to me because I could feel my tank running empty. What I found at this point is there's nothing that can sustain you. There's nothing that can continue to feed you and uplift you and strengthen you like, like God can. And then most recently, one I've been really focusing on and, and, and praying over is Philippians 4, 6, um, where he says, do not be anxious. If you're like me, that sounds easier said than done. Oh, great. Yeah, just don't be anxious. It's easy. Um, the Greek behind that, I don't know how to pronounce it, but the Greek behind that shows that um, they're using anxious as a verb with a connotation of meditation. So don't meditate or ruminate in your anxious thoughts. Don't sit in that. Um, but through prayer and petition, give that to Christ and he can take that and he can carry that. So that's been the biggest thing is, is my um, focus and turn to, turn to prayer and giving this to God, letting him carry it because I can't carry it alone. One of the lies of Satan is, is that you're the only one who thinks like this. You're the only one who's dealing with this. Yet if you knew Dalton, like I know Dalton, he's one of the most joyful, friendly, happy guys, wonderful husband, father, great friend. I played softball with him. And, and I go, well, Dalton doesn't. Yeah, Dalton has as well. And you're not alone in this. See, unchecked worry and anxiety leaves us in a debilitated state. And it has this ugly cycle where it drives us into isolation and isolation drives us into anxiety and anxiety drives us into isolation and then isolation drives us into anxiety and it just and it just continues the cycle. It robs us of our passion in life and, and it causes us to miss wonderful memories that are going on around us, precious moments in life that we can't even see because we're so blinded by the anxiety. And it takes work to break that cycle. I am so thankful that Jesus doesn't just make it sound like, oh, everything's peachy in this world. You follow me, Jesus pill, it's all good. We try and take heaven and describe earth by it. You know what Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart because I've overcome it. In other words, there's a future that you can, you're going to go through problems. You're going to go through hurt. The Bible describes that very clearly. But he says, I want to go through that with you and help you in the midst of it. So Jesus knew we would deal with it. These are not new issues just for this moment in time. They've been around since the beginning of time because we live in a fallen, broken world. And there's free will here. And I love my free will. I just don't like yours. And the same thing happens the other way. See, I demand free will. I do not want to be a puppet. But at the same time, that means others aren't. And then that means people can hurt people and then hurt people hurt people. And it, it creates this vicious, ugly cycle in the world. And we go, where are you, God? And, and he calls us to be his followers, to bring light into the darkness, to be his church. And he promises to walk with us as we go through. So as followers of Christ, how do we deal with worry and anxiety because we're not immune. Your pastor's not immune. People in the seats next to you are not immune. You're not immune. Well, anxiety and worry can subside. Notice I didn't say be fixed, go away, all be done. Subside, as in the definition is less intense. So I'm not oversimplifying. Anxiety and worry can become less intense, subside, when we are regularly reminded of two truths that God needs to put in our heart and Satan tries to steal, God's goodness and his greatness. See, I know in my own life when I'm struggling, when anxiety has started to kind of rise up, when I, 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 life has gotten so busy that I'm not doing some of the things that I know I need to do, you know, I find that when anxiety has started to creep in, I've always started to doubt one of those two, his goodness or his greatness. And it doesn't matter how I feel about it. What matters is what is true. And so I have to focus into the truth no matter how my feelings are. And then God begins to do a work in that. So the importance of his goodness is I need to focus on his goodness because that's where his love, his tenderness, his grace, his care, his walking with me all come to life. 
and he is good. And I've seen his goodness in my life. I've seen it in others. And, and sometimes when you're blind to it because of your own hurt, you've got to look for it in other places. And, and he is good. And sometimes you just got to remember for the moment, okay, God is good. I don't understand this right now, but he's good. And then you go, okay, what are, life's out of control, and there's just nothing. And, and we're trying, we got to remember, he's great. He's above all this stuff. He is the God who's taken us towards heaven. He is going to say enough, and all of it's going to be gone. And, and we're going to have heaven one day, and he's going to walk through the crappiest stuff in this world with us if we just let him come alongside. See, he is our Lord, and he is sovereign. And I'm so thankful for, you know, the Bible is just littered with countless verses on his goodness and his greatness because every great hero of the Bible, every broken person in the Bible, and every person today needs to be reminded of those. You know, Jesus shares some powerful words in the Sermon on the Mount. I, I, I'm going to unpack this today. We're going to stay in one one chapter, Matthew chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, please open those up or follow along on the screen or in the app. Uh, I'm going to share this starting in verse 25. I tell you not to worry about everyday life. I like the simple just start. Yep, there's going to be problems in life. He's like, I recognize that. Life can be overwhelming. And yes, he said, don't let it overwhelm you. He says, whether you have enough food, drink, or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Oh, I need those rooms. He's not trivializing our problems. He's just saying, you know that life is more than that. Those are real issues. We need those. But he really does get our mess, our fears and our worries. See, you have a list that keeps you up at night just like I do. Every one of us has our list of things that, what do I do? How am I going to handle? And, and it's our fears and worries that we have to turn over to him. Jesus gives us a great illustration. Verse 26, he says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store foods in barns. Your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? He's like, God is good. He sees you. He cares. He's reminding us of that truth. And when we doubt that goodness, we start to try and control things that we can't control. And that kind of causes the anxiety to even get worse. And he says, okay, can all of your worries, verse 7, verse 27, can they add one single moment to your life? No. You know, worry causes us to try and grab hold and control people and situations, and then we end up driving people and other places and other things into a worse mess than they were because we're trying to control what we can't control. You know, let me give you an example of how this cycle works and some of the problems of how our minds are. And how many of your lives have been better because you started looking at WebMD? I don't know anybody who's better because of WebMD. I know everybody. They read it and they go, I could die. I'm going to die. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, I can't believe I'm still. And you see all these symptoms and you're like, oh, I'm so screwed up. And, and, and when, you know, I've heard this. I, I don't know who said it. It's been attributed to several people, but I found it so true. Worry does not stop death. It stops life. Worry doesn't take away tomorrow's troubles. It takes away today's peace. See, so much of worry does nothing but steal today. It robs you of moments that you could be involved in, of the peace that you could experience. And, and so there are times that you have to have this thing called faith. And I'm not saying blind faith. You just stick your head in the sand. Where you look at how he's been faithful to others. When you see how he's been faithful through his word. When you choose to trust him because 90% of what we worry about we cannot have any control over. That's just the truth. Studies have shown 90% of what we worry about we can't control at all. And I choose to put that in the hands of a good God. And he's a great God. Now, continuing, verse 28, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make clothing. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today, thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Do you remember as a, as a kid, uh, 
you know, that little song, maybe you were taught like I was, he's got the whole world in his hands, he's got the whole, that is such a powerful illustration and we need it today as much as ever. You know, I, I can just forget and I'm trying to control and I'm trying, and I just got to go, okay, when I try and control, the, the weight of this world just crushes me. But when I envision and remember that he's got the whole world in his hands, okay, he's holding what I can't hold. So verse 31, don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So what do I do? I, I'm so thankful he concludes this with some, some, some understanding, some passage here to say, okay, here's some keys that I can move forward with. Verse 33 says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. First principle there, I just draw out of there that I'm having to live by and I have to remember constantly is I got to seek him first, not a Sunday for an hour. I, I got I to gotta follow him Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then start over again or it doesn't work. It's putting him first. And then I find that as I do that, he's not just a Sunday morning God when I come to church. He's a God that's with me in every situation, and I can, I can submit myself to him and to my fears go to him and my future go to him, and my present does as well. And I'm so thankful for the next truth that I pull out of that. He's like, don't worry about tomorrow. That is such a, and I'm so thankful. He says, oh, tomorrow's going to be fine. No, he says, tomorrow's going to have enough problems. He's in this, it's going to be messy tomorrow. Just focus today. And so I try and say, okay, what can I do today? Now, that's where I want to take the next step in is today, some practical steps to dealing with anxiety. We're going to talk about some practical things that anyone in this room, anyone who is listening online, you can take a step on this. And it's your choice. See, if you continue to do the things that you've always done, you're going to continue to get the same results. The only way to have a different result is to do things differently. And that means probably being a little uncomfortable, maybe doing something you don't really like. Maybe you're going to hear something, and probably in just a moment as I unpack this, you're going to roll your eyes. Maybe not externally, but internally. You know, oh, yeah, it was just that simple. Well, you know, the crazy thing is it's a lot of simple, small steps that make big changes. So I don't have one magic step. Here, just say this one prayer. Whew, it's the Jesus prayer. It's all, it, it, it doesn't work that way. But I can be faithful in something small, be faithful in something else small, faithful in something else small, and then God works through each one of those steps. So the first one, these are not going to fix, but they're going to lessen. You could start a gratitude journal. This is one of the most biblical things you can do. And men, stop rolling your eyes in your head. I know you're like journal and gratitude. Oh, yeah. I mean, come on, give me something to do. And no, 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 no. You know what the Bible says? Think on whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is holy. Do you, do you, what, what is he saying? Maybe start a gratitude journal. You know, look for what you can be positive about. Look for something good. See, when life gets messy, there's science behind this. Please understand, I am not just giving you some mumbo-jumbo stuff that, oh, you know, positive thinking. No, there's science behind this. See, you develop neural pathways when you go through trauma, through hurt, through pain, through disappointment, and it becomes a rut that your mind gets stuck in. And it's actually kind of painful to get out of that rut. So when someone tells you, Everything in my life is bad. I, mean, I don't know. I can't think of a single good thing. I mean, my life's falling apart. I mean, they're not lying to you. That's true for them. That's the perspective that all that they can see. And the brain has trained that. That doesn't mean that everything is bad. And it doesn't mean that everything is falling apart. It doesn't mean that they're the, you know, nobody cares about them. That's all that they know at that moment. And how do you break that? Do you realize you have to train your brain to see something good? And I don't like this. I found it in my life when I'm getting a little bit of tense and Marcy and I have been fighting maybe on something. And, uh, you know, I, I have to choose to say, okay, what's good? What's good about Marcy? What's good about our marriage? What's good about this day? And as I find just little snippets, okay, it's not all that bad. 
And, and I don't, I'm not minimalizing. I'm just saying there is another side that God wants to teach your brain. And this is a biblical thing that's helped me a lot even recently. Second all is connect with others. Do you realize God said that you're designed to connect with others, with him and with others? That's the whole concept of the church, that we're not all meant to just be lone rangers out by ourselves. He didn't create us to be monks, to go out in a cave. He actually created us to be ones who go out as missionaries and ministers and people who love. And whether you're paid or not, doesn't matter. We're called to be a light in the darkness because we're better together. So spiritually, there's a lot of power in this. And, and I want to challenge you to understand isolation creates anxiety, and anxiety creates isolation, and then isolation creates more anxiety, which that'll just be a horrible cycle you got to break. So spiritually, we encourage you to be here a part of the big group. This is worship. It's a small connection, but it's important. There's power in coming together. And beyond that, you have to get closer. you got to get into deeper relationships in some capacity in a small group where you get to know. For us, the on-ramp uh, on for that is rooted. We have just a short time to sign up for our next 10-week session. Out of that comes all of our life groups. So I encourage you, if you haven't gone through Rooted yet, if you're not in a life group, jump in. Go through that. It'll be a blessing that'll teach you a new way to think and teach you some basic things and get to know others. And, and you'll find a blessing that comes out of that. You know, ladies, if you haven't signed up for the Grounded uh, Gathering, oh my goodness, please do. We are at the very final stage of that. We're, I'm so stoked about it. As I hear them planning all the stuff that's going to go on, you could get to know somebody else. And there are wonderful people who care about you. If you'll just make that uncomfortable step to say, okay, I'll put myself out there and I'm going to try and connect. Every Tuesday night, 7 p.m., up in our chapel, we have a wonderful ministry called Celebrate Recovery. Some of the best people in our church that are going to be so overwhelmingly loving and grace-giving, they'll accept you in, they'll walk with you, whatever it be. You know, you just got to make that step to say, okay, I need some help, I need to connect. And it might go deeper than just what we do here. That's why we have that resource for connections with counselor. You might need to connect with a counselor. You might need to sit down and talk with your doctor as well. There are different routes to this. Remember, situational, biological, there's the clinical and the spiritual. And now let me go on to another one God has given, and that is that of scripture intake. And I mean, scripture intake is vital for your health. It was about 15 years ago. When I stopped just taking from the word, I, I knew the word, and I could preach, and I was telling people about the word. Here's what you need. Here's what you need. Here's, you know, this is truth for you. When I was really convicted by a mentor of mine, say, stop that. I'm like, I got to give the truth. No, 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 no. You still give the truth, but you're missing a step. And I'm like, what? He says, you got to take from here and plant here, and then it's out of the overflow you talk to others. Don't talk out of just knowledge you got to talk out of what has transformed you. And so you need to say a prayer, and it not just be about sermon prep. You need to say, God, what do you want to say to me? And it needs to be a daily thing. And out of that, we developed a reading plan. You can download the UCC Hub app. You would read the, the same scriptures that I'm reading if you do that. Go to the Bible, then go to plan, and then go on from there. It is vital that you say, okay, what am I going to do to let God soak down into me? The Bible is the primary way that God speaks. Now, you also need to learn to talk with him. Prayer is simply a way of talking to him. I know you may have heard some order. You may have heard somebody talk. You may have, you go, well, I can't pray like that. I have no idea. what. <laughs> you know, prayer is just simply talking. Tell him about your fears, your hurts talking to him just about life and then saying, okay, God, I need your help. I want to share another story with you. And this story is of a young woman who goes to church with us, Shanning, who her story deals with really literally every situation we could talk, the situation, the biological, the, the spiritual, and the clinical. And I think you might relate with this story. Would you please take a listen? So I've been a Christ believer my whole life, and by the time I was 19, I was becoming pretty comfortable with my independence. I was pretty proud of all the things I had going on, and I was just 
really digging life. Although I started questioning some things about God, I felt like he was going to hold me back from all the things I wanted to do and began to disagree with some of the life standards that God calls us to live by. And I settled on the conclusion of why would God create this world if we weren't supposed to enjoy it and all that it offers? So I began waitressing and bartending in the summer of 2022. And that same summer, I experienced a really tough heartbreak and that affected everything about me for the next year. I began drinking heavily, I hardly ate, and I worked way too much while attending school full time. I was just doing anything I could think of to drown my sorrows. And I wound up um, being pretty bitter and angry and kind of mean and I was just so lost by the end of 2022 that I, I no longer recognize myself. And then in January of 2023, something happened that I describe now as my self-implosion. I began experiencing extreme anxiety and intense consecutive panic attacks. And at the time, I did not know that there was a name for what I was going through, and it was unbelievably scary. I would describe a panic attack as an hour or two, sometimes less, sometimes more, where your mind goes into a state of fight or flight, and it's telling you that something is extremely wrong, but nothing is, you're just like going about your business. And my mind felt out of control. I was coming up with scenarios that I'd never fathomed before. I was afraid for my life and my loved one's lives. And I figured that if I explained to anyone the crazy thoughts I was having and the terror I was in, that I would be classified as insane. And I truly, deeply believed that my life was over. And the entire time, I was just praying and praying and praying. And one day my mom, she read me the 23rd Psalm and I felt as though only in heaven, if I was lucky enough to get there, could I ever lay in green pastures and walk beside cool waters again, which is part of that verse. Um, and the final day of battling panic attacks, I woke up early in the morning and I was in the middle of one. And anxiety has a lot to do with how well you're resting and the fight or flight response of panic attacks makes it really difficult to sleep. So it's a super vicious cycle and I was so exhausted. The enemy had a hold of me. Um, I've never been more afraid in my life. And I went to my doctor the very minute the clinic was open and I was given a prescription that would be ready that day later in the afternoon. And I saw a therapist that afternoon and she asked me some tough questions. She taught me some coping methods and she gave names to what I was experiencing. And it was the first time I had heard of panic attacks. I then left the office in an act of panic and I went to Old Navy with my best friend. I did not want to be left alone at that time, so I went with her. And while I was at the store, I distinctly remember the clothes I was touching um, and looking at when I thought to myself, I wonder if this is what people that commit suicide feel like. And I said, God, if this is what living is going to be like, then I just, I don't think I can live anymore. And I'm so blessed that the next stop that we made was the grocery store where my prescription was filled. And um, I took that medication immediately. And for the first time, my mind became quiet and it became calm for the first time in that two weeks. And I slept all night that night. It reminds me of the story of Jesus in the boat during the storm where the disciples were afraid and Jesus woke up and rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and they calmed. The next morning I walked to class and I was just overwhelmed with joy to feel the cold air on my skin and look at the dormant trees with no leaves and I do not like winter at all but it was just beautiful to be able to see it and my mind was still and all was well because I was alive and I could not believe it was over, it was done, um, God had won the battle and death lost its grip on me. Then in September, I joined a rooted group and that was like the best decision I've ever made and it taught me all I needed to know to know that I wanted to follow God for the rest of my life. Rooted brought me into fellowship with really strong believers that have demonstrated God's love for us and, and were so patient with me while I was learning. I decided to get baptized and truly be washed clean by the blood and nothing has rang more true to me than when I heard that with Christ, my old self was put to death on the cross and through him I breathe now. And I'm a new woman because God saved my life. He's brought to light all of the beautiful plans that he has had for me all along. And I can say with full confidence that panic and anxiety and heartbreak and confusion will never control my life again. If you resonate with the things that I've said or you're worried about a loved one that's maybe going through this, just know that you're not alone. Um, 
there's so many people that have gone through the same things. Please talk to someone. Don't don't be alone in this. Um, take it from me. I was a really lost lamb, and I was in a really dark place, and God pursued me, and he found me because he's an incredible promise keeper, and he's a good shepherd, and, and God's got you. So please hang in there. If you feel like that lost lamb or maybe someone in your family or one of your friends has been struggling like that, please know that there is hope, that he is a good God and he will walk by your side and there are people that he is, he is equipped and strengthened to help you if you allow them in on your journey. You're going to have to take a step and it might feel uncomfortable. It might be a little difficult and that's okay. Changing the the patterns of life is not easy. But oh, the, the good that can come from that is worth the effort. And so if it's connecting with somebody, if it's getting into the word, if it's learning to start to talk to him, if it's doing something as simple as just looking for a reason to praise or to have gratefulness in your heart, or maybe even a combination of all of those, do what it takes. You know, we're going to go into a time of, of just of singing in a moment. I'm going to pray, and, and I want to remind you, we have a prayer team throughout this series. If you want to talk to somebody online, you reach out. We want to talk with you. We want to pray for you. If, you wanna, if you're right here during the song and, or after the service, we're going to have a prayer team on your bottom right. There'll be a little light over there. It'll make it real clear. There'll be several wonderful friends of mine who, who are willing to just, they're not going to try and fix your problems. They're just going to be present. So would you stand with me and let me pray? Father God, we come before you and almighty God, and I ask in the name above all names that you would just shine the light into the darkness for anyone who is struggling. God, would you just take away the lies that the evil one has tried to place there. Begin to just peel back those lies and, and replace it with your truth. Let them know that you care, that we care. Let them know that there's hope beyond the despair that they're fighting. And God, I thank you. I thank you for each moment. One more moment just to say, here I am. And I'm going to choose to praise you no matter how I feel. Lord, I pray that that begins as we sing this song in Jesus' name. Amen. Now that my end, you just get started. When I hit a wall, you just walk through. When I face a mountain, you are the maker, so it's God. You're the God of break When I'm breaking down You'll be working away There's no way out This one thing I know That you're still on your throne So whatever I'm feeling I still got a reason to praise 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 
Another powerful word, another week with a really heavy message. But think about it. Spend time this week meditating on what we talked about today. Remember, Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. It sounds too simple. I'm like, the way I'm feeling, can I really just come to you and you're going to take it? Not only will Jesus take it, but he's going to carry it. Especially in the times where it feels like no one's there, Jesus is always there. Remember, if you need anything, prayer, resources, or support, head to university.church slash ufam. Drop us a message so we can connect. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.